Hey guys, Frank Cox here. Uh, welcome to the Smoker Builder Podcast. I'm Frank Cox, the barbecue pit engineer. And on today's podcast, we're going to talk about what kind of air inlet should I use on my firebox and how big should it be? Stay tuned. Hey, anyway, thanks for uh, joining me here. I apologize that I do this in my truck so often, but you know, in the pit building business, it's eight days a week and 36 hour days. So I got to pick the best time I can to do this. So appreciate you listening and being patient with me until I find a better lifestyle that enables me to do better podcasts with less rumbling noise and stuff like that. So anyway, as promised, we're gonna discuss what kind of air inlet should I use on my uh, firebox, assuming you're talking about a offset smoker, which is pretty much the most popular kind of smoker right now that uh, guys like me are building. Um, offset smoker, reverse flow smoker, whatever. And uh, you know, I've built a lot of pits and uh, I've also helped a lot of people build a lot of pits. And so I've seen a ton of different scenarios and uh, the most common thing is that we just expect that we let air in and the fire will burn, right? We don't really think about the path that the air has to take as it goes through the firebox. So let's talk first of all, and I've hit on this a few other times uh, just to help uh, develop that point I just made. Um, I've talked about this in a few other episodes in the past. Um, what happens is the the amount of air that is required for that smoker to run and cook effectively and efficiently is not just the amount of air we need for fire, right? We have the, the fire triangle, you know, we're gonna have so much air come in and it's gonna be about 850 CFM per pound of wood, right? Now, that's a pound of wood being consumed per hour, okay? So that's a pretty good fire. But if you start looking at it from that lens, that's a lot of air just for combustion, okay? Now, if that air goes across the top of your fire, only the surface of your coal bed will be, in, will be getting enough oxygen. Because what I've found, and I'm sure that other people will probably agree with this, but what I've found is that the, the, coal, the part of the coal bed that is under the top part of the coal bed, if it's on the bottom of your pit, for instance, is insulated from getting air. Air is not gonna dig its way through the coals and try to get down inside that and burn, right? The only time I've been able to make that happen is when the air comes in completely under the fire. And let's say that coal bed is sitting on a log rack and the surface area around that uh, log rack is completely blocked off. In other words, you've got a square grate that's uh, in the middle of your firebox like this, in the middle of the, the surface area of the box, and you got air coming in, air's always gonna take the easiest path. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna come up and hit that coal bed, and it's gonna literally spin out and go around the coal bed. Some of it will make it through, but not all of it. So I've played it off around that square log rack in there a few times and forced all of the air. The only way air can go through that pit is to exit through the top of that coal bed. That is as efficient as you can make this thing run other than a thing called a reburn, which is a second fire, a second way for that air to enter that coal bed. But we're not doing that in the smoker. That's like a wood furnace kind of thing. So um, what happens is, is that if you force it all to go through that coal bed like that, I, it's not necessarily the best scenario either because the cleaner that uh, fire burns, the less flavor you're gonna get. So what we wanna do is we wanna have some kind of a, uh, like a, a hybrid of that situation to where we've got a good amount of air, the amount of air required for complete combustion goes through that coal bed or across the coal bed directly instead of having to come down and go through the coal bed. And we want to have enough air going through there that it will be heated and carry the temperature or the, the BTUs to the cook chamber to heat us to whatever temp we want to cook at regularly and reliably so we don't have swings in temperature 
and things like that. Anyway, that's a big long sentence. I hope that made sense. If you need to, hit the rewind button real quick and uh, you can go back and listen to that whole statement. But that's essentially what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to make sure that we not only have enough air for combustion, but also enough air to transfer that heat from the burning of the fire through the cook chamber in an efficient air pattern, such as though it weaves in between all the meat and even under the meat, because we don't want the top of our meat to cook and the bottom not, or vice versa. We want to be able to get convection around all of that uh, food load or whatever's in there, the heat or the meat, the, you know, it could be cauliflower for all I know, whatever you're cooking. So um, anyway, uh, so that's the point here. And so we're going to talk about a couple of different air inlet scenarios real quick. One that I see all the time is an air inlet in the dead center of the door. And as a matter of fact, you'll even see that on the Legend 2400. Um, however, that's not, I'm not saying that's wrong, but that's one way people do it. So when, when air comes in through the center of the door, that means that you have to be equal to or below the log rack in order to get complete combustion and achieve the scenario we just talked about, which is a sustainable fire that makes it easy to run your pit and deliver consistent results with your barbecue. So that being said, if your air inlet is in the middle of the door, your log rack also needs to be in the middle of the door. A lot of competition guys like this because they put a charcoal basket right in front of that and they want their air to go directly into and at the fire. That's why the Legend 2400 has the air inlet in the middle of the door accompanied by a log rack that is also in front of that middle of that door. Um, so you've got that part. And then if you look at a lot of the stick burners that guys are building their fire on the bottom, um, for instance, the ones I've built, you'll see the door opens and there's no door lip down there at all. It's just, it's just basically you open it up and you can easily clean out the ashes. But more importantly than that, if you build your fire directly on the bottom, you want your air to come in equivalent to or directly at that log, that uh, coal bed. That way you can get air mixed into that fire. The second part of that is that you're gonna have to continually spread your coal bed out. If you burn on the bottom and you let your coal bed start to build up and uh, you know and you don't like stir it around and get the fine ash out of there, like every once in a while, you gotta clean the fine ash out of the coal bed so that you've got coal bed and not ash choking out the fire. The, the more accessible that coal bed or them chunks of charcoal in there and wood are to the air going in, the better that fire and the more consistent that fire is going to burn. So anyway, what do I prefer? I like pinwheel dampers the best. If I'm going to do, if I'm going to do the scenario, the perfect scenario in my mind is to have, I like my fire on the bottom when I'm burning in a stick burner. Cause I like that really intense, you know, smoke flavor. I don't want to let anything get away, but I don't want it to be sooty. Right? So what I do is, is I burn my fire right on the bottom. I make it where I can use my air, my door as the air inlet, but usually I put a pinwheel damper there also. There's some scenarios when you get into a condition with wind that like if the wind, like with your door, it's going up a foot above the fire or, or 16 inches above the fire. So you can get in a situation where a lot of your heat is rolling out like that and it's kind of wasteful and you're, you could have a backdraw or a, you know, something like that happening in the pit where you're not getting all of your heat into the cook chamber, your draws messed up, backdrafting and stuff. So what I wind up doing is I want to leave that door closed and I open, I have a pinwheel damper in the bottom of the door in that scenario to where when you uh, want, you can close the door and open the pinwheel damper and all the air still goes directly across the fire. And it's less likely that you're going to get that. It's really what it is. You got so much air coming in from whatever that draw is that it'll spin up in the firebox and it'll roll down and you could have like spilling out. You'll see it come out and go up over the top of uh, the, the door, you know, and that's what we're trying to prevent. And when that gets going a whole bunch, you could actually have a backdraft in there, which is going to wind up drawing backwards for a, a brief second 
you want to see more about that, I have a YouTube video on my channel at Smoker Builder, literally showing the smoke doing that. Um, you got to go back a little ways. Um, can't remember what it's called, but anyway, yeah. So that's that's what you got to do is uh, you got to pay attention to where your air goes in the firebox, where the log rack is in relation to where that air goes in, and uh, you'll have a successful cook. Always remember that the coal bed needs air in the coal bed in order to get that complete combustion and reliability in your in your temperature uh, difference and everything else um, and your rhythm for running the pit like you don't want to have to go out 30 minutes and then be like oh well this time i think i need to come back in 15 minutes and mess with my fire oh i think i can get away with an hour and a half this time maybe an hour like that time all over the map maintaining your fire like that is 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 counterproductive to the, the what we're trying to do we want to have a consistent product with a consistent reliable result on how that pit runs in order to do that it's just a matter of making things work the right way so anyway i hope you found this video helpful um there's a couple of ways i can help you if you're just now hearing about me i'm frank cox the barbecue pit engineer i hope i just proved that to you and uh i build smokers for a living I do two ways. I do it myself where I build it for you, but also if you want to just do it yourself, I've got a vast library of ways that I can help you from everything from content like this all the way to my smokerplans.net website. Um, you can go on there and you can browse over 260 some set of plans, I believe now. Plus we've got tons and tons of parts and these are not just for stick burners. They're for all different kinds of pits. Gravity feeds, vertical reverse flows, pellet smokers, drum smokers. Uh, we got center feed reverse flows, hybrid uh, offsets, which are a reverse flow and offset for the indecisive. Um, lots of stuff like that. So, you know, go on in there and browse around and I think you'll find something that even you can build or you may want me to build it for you. So that's me. I'm your resource in barbecue. So I can help. All you got to do is go to smokerbuilder.com, smokerbuilder.com. It's going to, when you get on that website, it's going to ask you two, one question that has three possible answers. Just do what it says on the website and get your journey started to your next pit. If you're stuck, my phone number is at the very top of the page. And yes, I actually answer it. 573-BBQ-BBQ-7. That's me. Appreciate you. Till next time, keep your smoke thin and blue and uh, go ahead. You can binge on the podcast. I'm not going to get mad. See ya.